should walk away with some strategies that they can apply to their operations or future operations. Uh, you'll see from our slide here that we have an incredible and diverse uh, lineup of experts today joining us. Um, each of them will be sharing um, some key insights. Um, and internally, we've been calling them little nuggets because we know this is going to be very fast paced. So little nuggets from their journey in hemp production. And we will do the, our, the best we can to take questions at the end of each presentation. Uh, we'll come back together, as Rachel said earlier, at the end and have a little bit of time for Q&A and panel discussion as well. And uh, we know we can't possibly cover everything in two hours. We'll definitely try to cover a lot. Um, but I just want to assure you guys that this is just the beginning of some really amazing and intensive hemp content um, that we're going to be bringing to you from Acres USA. So originally, we had planned to have Mr. Doug Fine kick us off but I believe he is having some audio difficulties. So we are gonna kick this off with a discussion from um, Edgar Winters. So I'll give him a quick introduction. And Edgar's, Edgar, I, I think you're ready. Um, I would guess that uh, our next speaker, Edgar, um, trumps everyone on this webinar in terms of experience in the hemp industry. Uh, his hemp roots go all the way back to the 1950s when his grandfather raised hemp for baling twine. Uh, Edgar has been a part of the grassroots movement to legalize industrial hemp. Um, and in 2014, he received the first Oregon issued hemp license in 77 years. Uh, he operates Winter Fox Farms, a genetic breeding facility and experimental uh, station for various cannabis cultivars. And his passion is to have true American strains for each farming system, whether it's food or fiber or CBDs and have consistency in finished product. Today, Edgar will share some of his unique insight and demystify the foundation of hemp production, the hemp seed. Please welcome Edgar. Good day. Thank you, Sarah. Good day to each and every one who's here for this webinar today. I'm proud to be here. I want to thank Sarah and Rachel for inviting me for this webinar. And also Doug Fine, who's absent right now, but he is also a sponsor for me on this uh, true webinar. Today, I'm going to be uh, talking about seeds. Uh, cannabis sativa L is the true name of that. It's either called true hemp or Indian hemp. And today, I'm going to be talking about seeds and genetics. So uh, as, uh, uh, as we get started, let's go to the first slide, if I could, please. A little trivia here. Hemp seed is not really a seed. It, it is a fruit nut. People say, what in the world are you talking about? Well, anyway, uh, a fruit nut is the seed. Inside that seed is actually uh, protein and food. So it is a, considered a fruit nut since you crack the seed. Once the seeds crack, you have the nuts and the fruits inside. So it's another little trivia thing that people wasn't really aware of, uh, but we'd still call it a seed, but it really is a, a fruit nut. Next slide, please. There's two types of hemp seeds. Manesius and Deusius, as you can see on the diagram in front of you. Uh, Manesius is a uh, self pollinating plant. It has both the male, male parts, as you can see in the red circles, on the same plant. Uh, at the top would be the female, and at the bottom would be the, the male uh, bracts that you see there. Uh, the other strain that we have is Deusius, and that is going to be a plant that either has the male or the female plant. Uh, on it. So you'll either have a male plant or you'll have a female. And now uh, we do have an update. There is actually a third type seed in, in the industrial health arena today. And that is uh, uh, female seeds that are produced by phenomization. So it's going to be a female most every time. Uh, occasionally there might be a phenotype in there that might make it uh, a morphodite, but more or less it's going to be female 95% 90, of the time. And that uh, type of seed is used mostly for CBD productions. So if you're going to be growing for CBD, you'll probably be using phenomized seed. Most all your farmers here in America are, are going to phenomized seed. Next slide, please. Cultivars for the different commodities. Uh, these pictures you see in front of you are at our farm. Uh, this previous year. On the left, you'll see our CBD stock uh, flowers for our cannabinoid production for flower. 
Normally you're gonna do a seed rating of anywhere from 2,000 to 2,500 uh, seeds or plants per acre if you're growing for CBD. If you're growing for grain, the center photo, uh, superfoods, all propagation for future crops, your seeding rate's gonna be anywhere from 20 to 30 pounds per acre. If you're growing for fiber, you'll be more likely doing it for textiles, paper, bioplastics, uh, dynamite, several other reasons to grow for fiber. Uh, the seeding rate there is gonna be anywhere from 40 to 50 pounds per acre. You want that to be extremely dense because you want those fibers, as you can see in the photo, to stand straight up like a pencil. They're real close together. So the density will be extremely important to get uh, yeah, a good video. straight fiber streams. Next slide, please. Uh, Penal types and characteristics. When you're dealing with seeds, you, you're going to run into uh, these situations on hand. Uh, Penal type variations. Uh, typically, uh, unstable varieties will have up to seven different penotypes in it until it's become stabilized. Many may be remarkable, similar, and hard to distinguish. You really have to uh, uh, know what you're looking for when you're looking for seeds. Uh, it takes years uh, of experience to clearly identify all variations. Uh, some penotypes are obvious to any grower, such as dwarf penotypes. We're talking blueberries, uh, grapes, things of that nature that, that grow very small. Uh, characteristics is a very important part when you do, uh, come to seed acquisitions. Uh, what you're really looking for as a farmer, uh, you want good vigor. You want uh, that plant to be strong and, and resistant to drought. Uh, you want an early or a late maturity, depending on your location. Uh, size and yield is a very important factor. Uh, but the most important factor is stable and consistent. Uh, here in America, we're just getting started with our hemp program. So our seeds are not really stable. We're, we're dealing with uh, seeds that uh, we, we don't really know where the... Uh, uh, history came from. So we're, we're, we're learning as we plant these seeds and determining what penal type are we actually uh, looking for. Uh, strain stability is a, is a new cross of two known stable strains uh, in the hybrid industry like F1s and F2s. Uh, usually those, those hybrids take anywhere from four to five generations uh, of breeding to, to really be stabilized in, in your fields. Uh, ideally, you want a strain to have uh, a minimum growth of 10 generations. That way, you know consistently it's going to be stable, and every year you're going to get the same uh, type of genetics. Uh, older established CBD strains are generally stable already. We've been doing this now for about four years here in Oregon, so we've kind of got some pretty good stable CBD strains. Uh, some of the new CBG strains, a lot of farmers are interested in CBGs, which is the precursor of all cannabinoids. Uh, it is less stable because we haven't been growing it for, for a long time. I think this is only our second year here in America that we've been doing for CBD strains. So if you're going to think about uh, CBG strains, make sure that you uh, have a, a history of where, where they came from and how long they've been uh, stabilized. Next screen, please. How a breeder can uh, accommodate a genetic variety. A lot of people are wondering, uh, how in the world can I get a good stable strain established at my farm? Well, first and foremost, you wanna start with solid and stable strains for sure. Uh, if you're gonna be crossing strains in your area, you wanna make sure in your local climate, uh, meaning latitude and longitude. Example here is in, in Oregon where we live, uh, we're on the third, 43rd parallel. So you, you wanna make sure that uh, you get your seeds that are almost already climatized if possible. That's not very much the case because we just don't have that right now. But in a two to five years, we will be having a lot of stable seeds in our marketplace. Uh, what you want to do, you, you want to collect those cuttings from the various penal types and you want to clone those cuttings. Uh, this process is more effective if you do it uh, before the plant goes into its flower stage. Uh, you want to hunt your fields you want to uh, journey through the harvest and make sure that you uh, find uh, the type uh, petal types that you feel that you want to grow for the following year. And what you do, you'd take that uh, petal type and you'd clone it and you would use it for your next round of breeding for your next uh, season. Uh, you really want to make sure that you're stabilized your genetics 
by breeding multiple generations, not just one year. Next slide, please. Seed certification procedures for hemp production. It's a very uh, strong topic today in, in America about our seeds being certified. Uh, we don't have a lot of certification in America, but we're working very diligently on that. I still think we're two to five years away from completely certification of hemp cultivars. But uh, you, you, you really want a paper trail. You want a COA, you want a paper trail that shows where, when, how uh, this seed was propagated so that you'll know that when that plant comes up, you're not gonna be surprised with uh, a penalty that you really didn't need. Next slide, please. And how to go about that, uh, we have a, an agency here in America called o OSASHA. It is an association of official seed certifying agencies. We have them in a lot of different states. I know we have one here in Oregon uh, that I use. Uh, but if you're thinking about getting your seeds certified, uh, this is an agency I recommend that you go to and they would be more than happy to help you uh, get your seeds certified. Next slide, please. A difficult uh, slide here, understanding cannabinoid concentration and total THC. Most all farmers in America today are very scared about going hot when they plant their seeds uh, because they just don't know what the phenotypes have been in the present and the past future. So what we try to do, we try to go by a CBD to THC ratio. And that's how we calculate our total THC and make sure that uh, our crop is not going to go hot. Uh, and that's called cannabinoid management. Uh, cannabinoid management starts with genetic selection, of course. Each strain uh, or cultivar has a ratio programmed into its genetics that will not vary from time to time, even though it will uh, environmentally can produce a different uh, phenotype. Uh, we're still studying that at Cornell University. They're not really quite sure uh, if, um, if it works or not. But anyway, we want to make sure that we have a, a ratio uh, of 30 to 1, say the CBD THC, so we know exactly uh, how to calculate that with one of them each other. Uh, there's a formula down below uh, that we go by for total THC calculation and the Delta 9 THC content. Uh, it's where you take your Delta 9 THC, you'll, you'll add it to 0 0.877, and then time your, your THC acid form. And once you get that total THC of the total uh, Delta 9, you will add 87% of the naturally occurring THCA. Uh, example here, uh, say if you had a strain number one and it had a THCA uh, value of 0.26% and a Delta 9 THC value of 0.4%, which is legal in, in the US. So you take that formula, you add it together and you'll come up with your total THC C value. And this example, as you see here, is 0.26% THC total. So you would be, uh, you would pass in your state uh, with that type of uh, percentage points. Next slide, please. Last minute thoughts, and I'll close today and, and talking about uh, uh, seeds and how, how to really make sure that you get the right seed protocol. Uh, first and foremost, you really need to know your seed provider. Uh, you want to try to get local strains if possible. It's kind of hard to do in, in this world today, but we are getting closer and closer every year that we plant hemp in America. Uh, last and foremost, always check with your local Department of Agriculture. They usually have a list of accredited seed providers. And uh, going with your, your Department of Agriculture for that as well. And uh, a few states already have certification in their states, uh, Colorado, Oregon, we're working very diligently ourselves on that. And uh, I think Vermont and a few others are, are real close to certification as well. So I wanna close uh, with uh, what we do at our company most and foremost is Hemp Up America. We, we go out and we try to make every farmer successful in this world and we want them to hemp up and have a good commodity and stable for American farmers so they could have a new protein uh, dietary supplement. They could live by, sleep by, build homes by, and medicinally uh, make you feel better in, in the long run. So I'll close on that thought and thank you so much for listening to me today. Wow, uh, 
Thank you, Edgar. And I think we have an overachiever. He finished two minutes early. So we have a few more minutes for questions. So that's excellent. Um, I, we had a few audience questions come in, Edgar. So I'm just gonna pull those up and I'm gonna start with those. Uh, first, um, someone writes, I'm wondering what your thoughts are on the lack of regulations regarding seed genetics in the current US markets, depending on what you're growing for. That's an easy one, right? Okay, uh, if the question was asked is, uh, what type of seed should I grow for? What part of the plant I wanna grow for? Is that what we're asking me? I'm sure it is. But yes, uh, you know, genetics is a very important part. Uh, there's basically three or four different parts of the plant that you can grow for. Uh, food and, uh, is one for seeds, you'd be growing for food. Uh, our propagation, regrowing. If you're growing for fiber, you, you want a good uh, deosa strain. I know a lot of people are using Menesis, but uh, Menesis has is, is been used and overused so much in Europe that it's not as uh, a bigger as it used to be. So well, I recommend deosis where you'll either have the male or the female plant uh, on that. Uh, so you'll know exactly what you're, you're going to get. Did that answer the question? Uh, I believe so. And I'm navigating through all my questions here. So just one second. Thank you. Uh, next question is, what's the best source for feminized seed for CBD or for CB and for CBD? Uh, feminized seed for CBDs. Well, it's a very big, uh, very big uh, industry these days. They're, they're, uh, when I first started out six years ago uh, as a seed broker, I was maybe one of four in the, in the U.S. that was actually growing for seeds. Now I get uh, people calling me, emailing me. Uh, at present, I think we have over 200 different uh, entities that want to sell you phenomized seed. Uh, we haven't really stabilized those seeds yet, but they're, they're still out there. So I would be real careful about who I got those phenomized seeds from because a lot of times we found that uh, the germination rate was not uh, 95 to 100 percent like has been uh, told about. So you got to make sure that you're you're getting some good phenomized seed. And the only way to do that is is to know your broker, know your seed provider, uh, do your research, and make sure that uh, you are purchasing some seeds that will be beneficial for you in your in your farm applications. Thank you. Uh, and then we've been getting a lot of questions even prior to the webinar on cover crops. One, one of the questions we have here is, is there a better strain for cover crops? Uh, no, not really. A strain is a strain. Cover crops has nothing to do with uh, industrial hemp. Uh, I do cover crops every year. Like right now, I just plowed, it, uh, plowed under my, my rye. I do rye, I do alfalfa, I do clover. Uh, things of that nature, legumes, anything that has a green manure effect, you want to put it out as a cover crop before you plant for the spring season. Uh, right now in Oregon, we probably have already done all of that. Our crops are actually being uh, prepared to be planted. I'm planting this week myself uh, on my 25 acres. So uh, a cover crop is a good thing to have, especially if your soil is not uh, up to par. You know, we have live earth or you have dirty dirt. So uh, if you want a, uh, a good planting source, you want to make sure that your, your earth is, is, is alive and, and well. And having a cover crop uh, over the winter months will make sure that you will have the right nutrients in that, in that soil. Great. That's a question I didn't think we'd get covered here, and we did. Thank you. OK, I think we have uh, time for one more. And I think I'm going to stick on that same theme here, and, and you may have already started to answer it, but how are folks managing competition and ensuring good establishment without tilling or turning entire rows of soil? Sounds like you might be doing some of that. I'm sorry, I, uh, you, you cut out on me with a question again. Yeah, sorry about that. Uh, how are folks managing competition and ensuring good establishment without tilling or turning entire rows of soil? Well, uh, no tilling is, 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 is very popular, uh, especially in, in communities in Oregon. I know we do have a lot of people that do no till. Uh, I, I don't uh, particularly do no till anymore. And the reason that I don't is because uh, all the impurities that you get in, in, in your different variations of, of species in your garden, uh, they could actually uh, impuritize your seed stock and you have to go through all kinds of trouble to get those uh, foreign uh, impurities out of, out of that. So uh, 
I don't know till uh, a lot of people do. Uh, I believe in it as far as vegetables uh, and fruits, but uh, as far as industrial hemp, uh, I, 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 don't, I don't do no-till. I make sure that I test my soil before I even plant and to see what's not in the soil, not what is in the soil, but what is not in the soil. And then I'll adjust accordingly to that. That's great, thank you. I think, uh, I think that will wrap it up now. If any of our other speakers have um, different comments on no-till, uh, that would be, we'll be interested in hearing that later in the program. Thank you so much, Edgar. Uh, we're going to take a thank very- Thank you. Thank you. We're going to take a very quick break or pause here just to say thank you to our generous sponsors who are not only supporting us here on this webinar today, but also for our in-person event, Advancing Industrial Hemp, um, scheduled for October 5th and 6th in Greeley, Colorado. So we will jump into that and then we'll get back to Doug. All right, <laughs> you guys get the picture. We're very grateful for our many sponsors, so thank you. Uh, okay, so we are moving back to our kickoff speaker here, Doug Fine. And in the hemp and cannabis sphere, Doug Fine, our first speaker, now our second speaker, is a farmer, author, and well-regarded researcher and consultant for, all, for projects all over the world. He is an award-winning culture and climate correspondent and author of several books, including Hemp Bound and American Hemp Farmer, which published this year. Doug is also working on Acre U Acres USA's first ever online hemp course, ready later this year. Yes, we're excited about that. And today we will be starting, he will be starting us off or almost starting us off, thank you, Edgar, uh, with some valuable lessons for entrepreneurial hemp farmers. Please welcome Doug. Thank you so much. Thanks to, to Acres, to uh, Sarah and Rachel. Uh, I want to thank Trent behind the scenes uh, for helping us get the uh, uh, sound working. And um, to Edgar and all the um, participants here today, as well as the sponsors, I could not be a bigger fan of Acres. This is as good a resource as you could ask for for farmers. And what I, where I call, hemp is a very big tent. And I'm in from the farm today. My hand fingers are dirty. I've already been out there um, discussing with my sweetheart about dr the drip because I'm learned my lesson. Uh, you learn, you've got to do it. And I've learned, even though this is my second crop in New Mexico, after many crops elsewhere, Edgar and I have planted together, that yes, I live in a high desert at 5,700 feet, but hemp doesn't need much water after germination. And I was over watering last year. So I'm resisting the urge because our monsoons range haven't come this year. The hemp is sprouting. You know, I feel like a midwife and I'm so excited. And um, so I've been touching hemp plants with plants within the last few minutes. And um, I'm resisting this urge to, to water more than every other day just for an hour on our on our drip emitters. So um, uh, it's it's the real deal. And hemp is a very big tent. And so I don't, there's nobody um, in hemp as long as you know it's non toxic and all that uh, that I'm opposed to. But the constituency that I am part of and that I um, to, to some degree feel that I represent is the farmer entrepreneur, the independent regenerative farmer entrepreneur. And so that's what I'm gonna be talking about um, mostly today. Um, this first uh, slide, first of all, the image, this was Edgar and I cultivating a cultivar um, called Samurai that I'll talk a little bit more because it involves a big policy 
update we need on uh, the on the federal THC definition. But beautiful, beautiful crop. Edgar, I'm so glad was uh, speaking today. He he is um, one of my primary hemp mentors, and I'd been planting that cultivar. Edgar's a great breeder, but I brought this cultivar to our relationship, and and Edgar said, "Let's plant it tighter than you've been planting it," because I've been getting giant trees these redwoods of hemp and look at he was right as usual beautiful lush crop that pr produced uh over a thousand pounds of seed superfood superfood security sound relevant for now per acre um and the motto that i'm bringing is what you see here this time the farmers are in charge yes we're the fastest agricultural industry ever to pass a billion dollars in annual revenue in hemp but this only matters if the farmers are generating the revenue in my view, again, big tent. You want to go to a chain drugstore and buy some kind of isolated CBD from who knows where? Fine, it's probably going to be cheaper, but that's not what I want to eat. And that's not what I want to rub on my body. And that's um, not what I think is the top shelf varietals that are going to be the very, uh, very, very top thing. And it's also not only providing a better product, like fresh squeezed orange juice is better than concentrate, but as my friend Bill Althaus of the organic Fat Pig Society Hemp Co-op in Colorado puts it, farmers today get about three cents on the retail dollar uh, for any farm product. We want a hundred cents less expenses. And so that's our goal here. And what are we doing it? We're doing it by providing the best products and sequestering climate change. Can you see the smoke in the back of that picture? Half a million acres on fire in Oregon that year. And we were cool, weren't we, Edgar? Cool and moist in that crop uh, when we were farming that crop. Next slide, please. So this is sort of that same message that value added is the way to go. Um, many of you will know about Wendell Berry, the uh, famous farmer philosopher from Kentucky. His family was instrumental in stopping the ripoffs of tobacco farmers in the South at the end of the uh, 19th century and forming a cooperative. So I tried to invite him to come speak at a hemp conference my friends were running in the South because he's from Kentucky. And his institute said, write him, he's getting on, write him uh, at P.O. Box 1 in his town in Kentucky, Point Royal, Kentucky. And I did, there's the letter on hemp paper, of course. And uh, he liked that, he called me back immediately and I saved the voicemail. I'm paraphrasing what he said, but I'm passing on the message to you. He said, I'm a little too old, uh, not so mobile. I can't get to this conference, but here's the message I'd like you to spread. And this is what I spread every day in my books and my talks and in my head and in my life and in my product, which is, we are not going to be the wholesale serfs as farmers that farmers have been for just about every other crop for the last hundred or so years. He said, you've got to market your products. You've got to be con control the, sor the source. Uh, otherwise, strangers or hedge funds are going to pay you the least they can. Look at chicken farmers in the mid Midwest. Look at everything farmers. Right, so farmers are struggling. We, we have a farm aid, we don't have dentist aid. So how do we get around that? We market value added products. Now that sounds nice, but I have to tell you from being in it and from spending years researching it and working, plant, interviewing people for books and television and everything else, it's hard, it's risky. Entrepreneurialism is risky even when you're not at mother nature's whim. And so we have our work cut out for us, but if it's your calling, this is the way to go. Farmers used to have a deal with society. You harvest it, you're done. Uh, you might get ripped off. The, the pesticide conventional farming might be toxic, but at least you're done and you can mend harness and eat some popcorn and watch some movies. Not anymore. Your work's just starting at harvest. You are farmer entrepreneurs. Next slide, please. Tied in with this top shelf varietal hemp that I'm advocating. So vi visualize the fact that you can only call Parmesan cheese, cheese from the Parmesan region of Italy, champagne is from France. If it's from California, it doesn't matter if it's good or not, it's sparkling wine, right? You can't call it champagne. So create the varietals from your region. And trust me, I can tell you from having projects all over that everything will be different everywhere. It's about the microclimate. It's about the soil. It's about the weather that year. Your vintage from one year is going to be different from the other. And that's something to 
to shout about your your cannabinoid ratio the entourage effect as they call it is going to be different right tied into this concept of varietals is the reality that we are in the ninth inning climactically i had my climate change pearl harbor it starts out my my new book uh, american hemp farmer this story of this horrible thing that happened to my family of uh and, and it could be worse everybody's okay humans are all okay but we had this 130,000 acre wildfire different from the one that Edgar and I experienced in Oregon. This is in my home in New Mexico. And uh, it scared a bear down into our ranch, killed almost all of our goats, except for baby Taylor Swift. All our goats are named after singers that we like, whose voices are a little uh, goat-like. And uh, we had one survivor and um, woke us up when my sweetheart and I were looking at each other as we were tending to these, these goats and uh, we knew this is it. We have to do something to fight climate change. And there's, it's, it's great. You should plant, in my view, I shouldn't use the word should, so I will avoid the word should. I will say, I think it is probably wise to plant outside and build soil so that you have the best product, way better in my view than indoor product, but also so that you sequester carbon. That's how you sequester carbon, grow regenerative style in outdoor soil. But it's beyond that. Your whole product, I should have had a bottle uh, of my product with me here today, but minimal plastic compostable labels uh here's a 3d printed goat uh from us grown hemp so goodbye plastic garbage patch try to deliver your products in in uh, uh, uh electric vehicles try to have a range a regional range the goal is not getting bought out by hedge funds or going public the goal is creating a farmer-based community building heartland enterprise so we don't need farm aid anymore but how big is big enough think about the growth pattern of your uh, enterprise. And do you wanna be the Kmart of hemp or do you figure out the metrics of how do I keep a community of some X thousand making a lot of money from doing the whole thing regeneratively and fighting climate change? So uh, it's, a, it's, um, it's part of our entrepreneurial mission as, as the people leading the hemp renaissance to communicate the message that we are part of moving the industrial pipeline to an entire regenerative post-petroleum mindset and thus helping save humanity. Just that. Next slide, please. Okay, um, I, I feel like I've been talking uh, a lot and may not have an immense amount of time, so I'll, I'll uh, keep these uh, points, uh, important points uh, in the bullet point category. First and foremost, we're dealing with federal regulation. Be careful what you wish for. Oh, and there's the bottle of product with the regenerative uh, uh, compostable label, non-toxic stickum um, glass bottle. Um, I grow at USDA certified organic in Vermont up to this point, this crop. And um, so that's the point, the point of the sort of maple syrup Ben and Jerry's kind of bottle, bespeaks your brand and all that kind of stuff. So we're legalized, hooray, we're legitimate farmers again. I don't, not that anyone had a right to take away one of humanity's most valuable plants for the last 8,000 years, but it was only 77 years and we're feeding our endocannabinoid systems again, which is great. Um, so on the food side, when we do food products, as of now, until this stuff shakes out, I officially label my product as for external use only, muscle relaxant, bath oil, that kind of thing, even though it's a superfood and I eat it myself. Um, what it is, is it's the flour from a dioecious crop, as Edgar mentioned, I too grow male and female flowers, infused in hemp seed oil, some of it from that very crop. So it's hemp cannabinoids in hemp superfood that is the, the hemp seed oil. So we have to do a, this is an uphill battle or, or at least we got our work cut out for us. We have to let the FDA know that we are talking about a new kind of craft top shelf market for our product up to let's say 15 tons of product per year. We want different rules than this over sanitizing world food uh, uh, nuking regimen that's going down with things like FISMA, the Food Improvement and Safety Modernization Act, terrible built law, and other things. They're well-intentioned, but the, the idea is nuke everything so that all microbes are killed and people don't get salmonella. That's good, but you want some microbes. You want good microbes. You want food safety too. So we're going to find a middle ground that's right for our industry. Because I don't know about you, the reason why I have goats is so I eat living food, not nuked food. And we want to establish that craft category for our hemp. And that's very important. That's an FDA issue. Next slide, please. Probably the most important issue right now in hemp, if those of you saw a, uh, the good folks at Acres uh, uh, have uh, uh, run a uh, commentary and an editorial uh, all over the place uh, in the magazine and online about this issue. It is, it is this. 
the farmer should not have to worry about THC anymore at all. THC irrelevance for the farmer is our end game. Our immediate first step, immediate right now, if you're interested in hemp, number one thing that has to happen is the federal definition of hemp. This is a law, a federal law that has to change, has to change from 0.3% for now, step one, to 1%. The National Farmers Union is already advocating for 3%. Eventually, we want the feds out of the THC game. There's no difference between THC, between cannabis and hemp, as because there shouldn't be, and there never has been throughout history for eight millennia. It's just a useful plant, whatever you use it for, sandals, party favors, food, superfood, whatever. Uh, but this 0.3 definition, it was an arbitrary choice admitted by the researchers who, who chose it in a 1976 paper. It's killing the industry. We can't have it. It's... 40% of crops are going hot. That samurai crop you saw, it's a superfood. We can help end the obesity epidemic. And Edgar and I have been biting our nails every year. Are we going to pass? And we do. We generally pass, but sometimes not. And if you hear someone telling you that only genetics matter and not location for a crop, crop they are completely wrong. I'll show you our COAs. We're 0.25 in New Mexico, 0.29 in, in, in uh, uh, Oregon. Yay. 0.5 something in North Dakota. And God, I don't even tell you point. What was it? 0.7 point something in, in Arkansas last year. First of all, all of those are micro amounts. They should not matter to the farmer because they're not going to the customer. Who cares what's in the flower if you're selling a seed product? But e even if you're selling a flower product, it should only matter if it's above some locally, not federally, locally determined level when it goes to the retail, to the market. The last person we should be burdening is the farmer. She's working hard enough. She shouldn't be sweating over these micro amounts. And then even the samurai, which we're you know trying to breed, and I'm doing here in New Mexico, I'm crossbreeding to try to temper the THC a little bit. Even that hasn't tested over 1%. So 1% THC, immediate number one change we need. Think Two minutes, probably... Doug. Two minutes. Thank you. All right. Next slide. Thanks. Um, just know this thing is really, really hard work. Leap in, but start small and have a multi-year game plan. That's easy to say if you're a struggling farmer and in, in other parts of the farming uh, world and you need to pay your mortgage now. I get it. I've got a mortgage too. But the reality is it ain't a gay rich, quick, catch rich quick scheme. That CBD wholesale market's already crashed. Wendell Berry's already right. It's gone from $3,000 a pound to $4 a pound for raw flour in Oregon. Uh, you got you to gotta be thinking long-term and value added. Next slide, please. Um, be careful about jumping into all the money. You know, there's money out there and we've all that have been in it. We've all had issues where we realize, you know what, you've got to have the same spiritual values. You've got to have the same mindset as anybody that's writing a check. Keep that in mind and you'll be much happier. Next slide, please. Um, just FYI, I like to process by ancient methods, shamanistic methods, but even if you're going to do some higher tech, higher volume methods, I think cold ethanol is pretty good. Um, try to power your place by solar power and all that kind of good stuff. So your energy use is not too crazy. Next slide. Um, yeah, we talked a little bit about this already, you know, uh, the best, if you're building soil, you're also going to get the best hemp product. Next slide, please. It's all about the soil. Forgive my fifth gear here. Next slide, please. For me, it's really about um, feeding my family, super food security and all that. It's super relevant now. I've been self-sequestered since 1999. Um, but the reality is my goats love the protein. Um, there's studies out of Canada showing chickens produce higher omegas when they're fed uh, uh, hemp food versus corn food. And even in your enterprise, this is a recommendation, or at least what I do, I just make the product that I and my family want to use. And when you have that mindset and you're the biggest fan of your product and you eat it every day as I have already today, and, and in fact, not only have I eaten it, but I've packaged up several for friends, which is why I didn't have a bottle with me just now uh, today. And I'm looking at the next year's crop. If you're living it, you're going to have a better product. Next slide. And I think I'm pretty much ready to wrap up here. And that take is your last slide. Can we go to that book uh, slide there? I think it's the next one. Oh, you know? Yeah, it's not there. That was the last slide you're seeing? Yeah. All right. I well, know what slide you're talking about. <laughs> the book is called American Hemp Farmer. It's available everywhere in book, ebook, and audiobook. I read the audiobook. 
thanks. To, thanks for uh, everybody for listening. And I'm here for your questions. Thank you, Doug. And I'm sorry, we in the second round of slides, we must have lost that that book slide. But yeah, we'll make sure you all get the information about American Hemp Farmer, um, sold from Acres USA and a great book on entrepreneurial hemp farming. Uh, okay, so we have a couple of questions here and we have about three and a half minutes for them, Doug. Um, first one, I want to start uh, where, where we start. How many acres or square feet in a gre greenhouse is viable for hemp production? Excellent question. The answer to that totally depends on your application. If you're doing pretty much a 100% cannabinoid product, so there's the main parts of the hemp uh, architecture, there are four. Um, well, five if you count the leaves, but flower where the cannabinoids reside in the little trichromes, trichromes that grow in the female flower, uh, seed, the superfood, fiber, which, you know, gonna save humanity by goodbye Pacific garbage patch and roots, which is phytoremediation, an industry in itself, it's, you know, the world's soils are struggling. So it depends on which of those you're growing for. If you're going for flower on an acre or even half an acre, if you're doing what I do, high value, small batch products, you could produce enough flour. Um, you'll have to source your lipid, you know, the base of your product somewhere else. So you won't be hundred percent farm to table, but you could do 10,000 units at one to two ounce bottles from half an acre of flour. Um, and if you do them, you know, I, I wholesale at $50 a bottle. So do 10,000. I haven't yet made 10,000 bottles. I'm scaling up to that. I've been doing thousand bottle, a thousand bottle runs, but if you do 10,000 bottle runs times 50 or 40 or 30, even that's a, uh, you know, that's a, that's an, a living on a, you know, or a good amount of money on a small amount of acreage. You want more for a seed product. And then if you really want to be farm to table and infuse in hemp seed oil or do something edible, hemp hearts, uh, or just infuse your flower in seed oil as I do, um, you'll want five to 10 acres minimum on the seed. Fiber takes much more acreage to be viable uh, in most cases. And that's going to require a lot of farmers to collaborate. Ideally, what I've been praying for is in a cooperative because we've all got the fiber, right? So we can be entrepreneurs with our other product, but then do something with the fiber and the big fiber markets right now are animal bedding and uh, hemp creep building material. Awesome, I think that probably answered another question we had prior too. Uh, okay, so one more question here. How dry do you keep your germination soil? Uh, should it be quite moist until germination, then keep it dry, dry for one day? Quite moist until germination and then dry is okay. Um, Again, we got triple digit temperatures here. This is the hottest, this next month is the hottest month of the year in New Mexico because um, we're, we generally don't get a huge amount of precipitation. And then climate change weirdness aside, our monsoon season starts in early July. And so for two months, we get daily afternoon showers and 80% of our annual rainfall. So this is the driest time of year. It's one of the hottest places on the planet right now. And as I mentioned in my talk, I, I have learned Again, every morning I go down there going, oh my gosh, oh my gosh, I didn't, I did, you know, every other day, gut check, I didn't drip yesterday, I'm going to drip this morning, hope everything's okay, and the plants are like, yay, you know, they're fine, they're happy, um, so bottom line, and then the other thing is I mulch, I mulch with organic goat poop and alfa organic alfalfa that's left over in my barn, and if I push that aside and feel down in the soil after not, not watering for two or three days, it's still moist. So it's not like I'm drying out my soil to desert. It's just, it doesn't require that much watering once you germinate. At germination, it wants moisture. Not, it doesn't want to puddle. It doesn't want wet feet, but it wants moisture and good so seed to soil contact. And then, then just keep an eye on it until flowering. Flowering starts after solstice. Uh, but while it's in the vegetative stage, watch your plants. If they look thirsty water on and for me it's a, a drip gallon every other day but for you in your climate it may be more or less i dry crop in vermont we use sprinklers in oregon but long story short watch your plants and then during flowering flowering you want to water maybe a little more i don't have to in new mexico because it rains every day but keep an eye on it and then you don't want your flowers getting wet close to harvest so keep an eye on, on that perfect thank you that's awesome so thank you doug i think we're gonna have to save uh the stories about what other singers you've named your goats after for another day, but we'll look forward to that as well. Natalie um, Martin, Bjork. <laughs> all right, there's a, there's a teaser for you all. <laughs> um, okay, so before we move on to our next speaker, we just wanted uh, to share a quick word from our lead sponsor, TPS Lab.
Thank you, TPS Lab, for your support of our hemp programming. We really appreciate it. Our next speaker has a lot to share. As if your uh, hands aren't cramping up enough from all the notes I'm sure you're taking, um, but be prepared. Uh, Noel Garcia is a certified crop advisor and serves as vice president of operations and technical director for TPS Lab. He is an expert in um, soil and plant health and consults with farmers internationally on a wide variety of crops, including hemp. Today, he'll be sharing some excellent keys to avoiding poor quality hemp. Please welcome Noel. Thank you, Rachel. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm with TPS Lab. Uh, today, I'll be talking a lot about some keys uh, to keep in mind. Uh, uh, hemp is unlike any other crop we've ever seen. You know, uh, I work with farmers, ranchers all over the world uh, with citrus, uh, uh, watermelons, cotton, and so forth, so many different crops but hemp is unlike anything we've ever seen before. So it's one that uh, can really cost you. So let's go ahead and start off here with some little information. Let's go ahead, next slide, please. So you can see, uh, this is from US Hemp Market. This is from last year where uh, wholesale CBD prices have uh, sort of start trending down uh, mid-summer or so, uh, flower, wholesale flower had peaked and then all of a sudden it comes down. So. Uh, we've seen this and you heard uh, Doug talk about, you know, we're getting, you know, over uh, 40, $50 a gallon now dropping down to a few dollars again. So what can we do? Uh, this brings to mind that uh, there's still the place for CBD oil and some of these other strains, CBG, CBN, but you've got to grow for quality and you've got to market it for that purpose as well. Next slide, please. So bear in mind, uh, Industrial hemp, cannabis sentiva, uh, is, is a rustic plant. Uh, yes, it will grow anywhere, but uh, if you want to co grow commercially for a top quality crop or oils or seed or fiber, you've got to pay attention to it. So it prefers a healthy, fertile soil. Uh, does not like wet feet, so you got to avoid that type of soil. Does not like compacted soils especially in drought prone areas, uh, you really have to have a, a, a nice uh, deep fertile soil, uh, preferably pH is range between six and eight. Uh, and the reason uh, preferably around neutral is most likely just to avoid some issues. Uh, temperature, soil temperatures prefers uh, uh, sowing, uh, soil temperatures above 48 degrees Fahrenheit, uh, can be sensitive to uh, frost up to five pure leaves, uh, less than 23 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, uh, overall vegetative stage is uh, between 66 and 80 degrees Fahrenheit preferences. Uh, again, uh, we cannot get all these preferences uh, all perfect in any location where you're growing it, anywhere you're growing it at, but uh, we can mitigate a lot of these stressors from having say a heavy soil or an alkaline pH or any of these issues nutritionally. And that's where I'm gonna be talking about how we can balance nutrition to sort of mitigate a lot of stress. Unlike some of these other crops, uh, stress can be uh, counterproductive on a hemp crop because it can come back hot. Next slide, please. So what pests can, hemp, can harm uh, hemp? Gray mold is one that could, could, uh, could cause mish, especially in high humidity areas. Uh, in Texas here, we're going to start growing it this, this summer. 
uh, here in my region, deep South Texas is very high humidity. So that's something we gotta be careful about. Uh, uh, last thing you want is you're near and uh, harvest and all of a sudden uh, here comes gray mold taking all your crop or, or a powdery mildew or, or downy mildew. So we've got to be careful. What can we do uh, nutritionally to mitigate that stress? Uh, hemp canker is another one that has uh, some is potential issues on hemp as well. Uh, insect problems, uh, aphids, leaf hoppers, root maggots, spider mites can be some issues. Uh, for example, some areas that be growing uh, across some cotton fields in the south or some, uh, you've got some potential to be a, a hose plant for some of these uh, uh, insects that can be harmful to your crop and, and rob them of some of their much new, needed nutrients. And generally speaking, an unhealthy plant is more susceptible to any disease and insects. So keep that in mind. If you can properly balance nutrition of your hemp crop, it will be definitely a lot less susceptible to insects or disease. Uh, remember nature, survival of the fittest. Next slide, please. So first thing I recommend is start off with soil analysis. Next slide, please. So soil testing, uh, basically it's a starting point. Uh, just like Edgar said, you wanna know what's missing your soil. Uh, do we have to do a pH adjustment? Are we too acid? Uh, do, do we have to add lime to increase that pH to avoid any nutrient tie up? Or are we too strongly alkaline that will tie up some of these nutrients? We have to uh, acidify the soil slightly just to make nutrients more bioavailable. But overall, what we wanna do is think of it as a, as a, uh, a rebuilding program or soil. And I like to think of it as a three-legged stool, the physical aspects of the soil. Remember, it does not like wet feet. So what can we do to increase soil tilth? Use the cover crops or increase in organic matter, use a compost or using tillage radishes or something to that effect, but also look at the nutritional aspect of it. Calcium is a foundation uh, of soil texture. So we have gotta make sure that we got enough bioavailable calcium. Chemical aspects of it, what's in my savings account? Uh, what do I have? And the question is, is do I have enough in my saving accounts to sustain growth throughout the growing season better yet? Can I release that or make a, a, a uh, get enough from that say, savings account to keep up with the demand. Hemp has a high demand once it starts going into a reproductive stage. So we got to make sure we can keep up with that demand. And of course, soil health. Uh, we're one of the few laboratories where we highly concentrate on soil health, which can be affected by physical aspects and the chemical aspects of it. So we want a healthy, fertile uh, microbiota in the soil to where we can increase uh, the potential to mitigate a lot of this stress. Again, also soil tests recommended uh, for developing a good starter or pop-up fertilizer. Uh, people that are interested in direct seed, uh, we've been working with a lot of people in the South where uh, germination rates of, of sometimes less than 50%. Uh, I think a lot of those uh, could be genetics, but I think it could be more of a texture issue, uh, say uh, crusting or lack of nutrients. Uh, or planting a little bit too early. Uh, this is where some of these pop-up or starter fertilizers with additions of uh, beneficial bacteria compost can highly increase the germination rate to higher than 80, 90%. Next slide, please. So that's a, uh, that's a soil test that we recommend. Uh, it's, of course, it's your nutritional aspect of it, your NPK, pH. Uh, we also look at the soil health index, the Solvita. Uh, but the other thing is hard to read there on the right hand side, but that's a list of 32 different uh, elements, including heavy metals. Uh, you heard uh, uh, Doug talk about phytoremediation. It is a bioaccumulator. So if you happen to have any lead or cadmium or arsenic in the soil, it will be accumulated taken to the plant. Last thing you want is don't do a soil test for any heavy metals. You go to a processor takes it. And guess what? They run a heavy metal test in your crop and now you're laced with arsenic. They can't do that. So I always recommend make sure and do a heavy metal test before you would consider uh, planting in any acres. Next slide, please. Of course, recommendations. Uh, 
labs are all over the place when it comes to recommendations. Most state labs will not even offer a recommendation just to the lack of, 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 of knowledge when it comes to the hemp uh, uh, crop. Uh, some labs are looking at some other crops and passing it as, as a hemp recommendation. I've heard some guys, some labs using onion as a, as a uh, recommendation for a hemp crop, which is not what you want to do. Uh, uh, we've been in business since 1938, so we've worked with a lot of different crops, uh, uh, worked with uh, hemp in Canada for many years, uh, worked with Kenef. Kenef is very similar, so it's got some very similar needs. So that's where we start bank based on our knowledge to adjusting and coming up with a, uh, a uh, removal rate for hemp. But again, it's such a new crop may take many years to come up with that data, but I think uh, as long as you have a lot of knowledge with different crops, I think it can really get pretty close to where we need to be. Next slide, please. Plant requirements, next slide, please. So plant variable needs, uh, as you heard uh, uh, Doug talk about early need, the need for water. Well, it follows the same trend for nutrients. Early uh, uh, germination to the early uh, vegetative growth does not need very much nutrients or water. Once it starts getting close to a reproductive stage where it starts blooming, then the demand increases. So question is, if you did a soil test last fall post-harvest or even early this spring, uh, what's a guarantee that those nutrients that came back say higher optimal in your soil test are actually getting into your plant? Okay, next slide, please. So what I recommend people do is, this is the uh, uh, hemp cycle. So early uh, sowing, emergence, very low nutrient needs. In fact, the first three, four weeks after emergence or transplanting, the plant does not require very much nutrients. So the worst thing you want to do is like most crops or most uh, uh, people would do is trying to put all your fertilizer up front. That's the worst, last thing you want to do because then you get very, vegetative once the plant starts growing, then once very vegetative, then you've got the uh, incidence of possibly uh, attracting more insects and disease and weeds, which you don't wanna do. So I tell people, follow that cycle, early vegetative, keep your nutrient needs to a minimum. Once you get into a reproductive stage, then that need increases. And that's where drip irrigation comes in, where you can fertigate and spoon feed that plant to mitigate a much of the stress. Next slide, please. So plant analysis, like you heard, uh, uh, agronomists or consultants use uh, established plant analysis data that uh, has uh, been uh, published for many, many years. Uh, hemp right now, people, a lot of labs and a lot of consultants are still working on it. But again, you have enough knowledge with different crops uh, that are very similar that could be very helpful to it. Uh, as the problem is, a lot of laboratories using old hybrids or old sufficiency standards for a lot of established crops that we don't realize that we, we're not uh, meeting the plant genetic potential. And I think that's where we are with hemp as well. We really don't know what the genetic potential is of a lot of these varieties. Uh, can we get 20, 25% potency? I, I think we can in a lot of areas. We, know. we just are limiting ourselves to, because of the lack of, of very nutrition or customized nutrition according to your local growing needs. Okay, next slide, please. So what can it do to manage this risk? Risk, unlike any other crop, you know, you don't manage your crop, you can use a cookie cutter program and apply these nutrients. Uh, best thing, the worst thing that can happen is lower tonnage, lower yields and so forth. But with hemp, it can come back hot and there goes your crop. So there's huge risk in growing hemp. Next slide, please. So this is where we start our hemp sap analysis. Next slide, please. It's basically a blood test that can forecast up to 21 days in advance what the plant will be deficient in before you see those visual deficiencies. So we call the hidden hunger. Uh, you might not see it now, but in the future, next 21 days or so, that will come back and haunt you because it will reduce your yields, it will reduce your quality overall. So there's a lot of consultants go out there and look at these leaves that are chlorotic and so forth that can tell us magnesium deficient, nitrogen deficiency. But remember, once you see those visual deficiency, it is costing your production, is causing you undue stress on that plant and the potential to increase your THC overall. So saponosis can avoid that issue. Next slide, please.
So best way to manage our crop fertility is asking the plant what it requires, okay? It's plant sap testing is the only analysis that can provide real time data on the nutrient uptake. Remember that soil test we did last fall or early spring, we had plenty of phosphorus. There's no guarantee that phosphorus is going to get into that crop unless you do a sap analysis and ask the plant, make sure it's being utilized. If not, we've got to do other things to make sure and release that or add additional nutrients to make sure that we can keep up with the plant demand. Okay. Again, it is the way to define the hidden hunger before you see those visual deficiencies. Again, I'm not saying soil tests are, 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 are good. I think it's mutually inclusive to do with sap analysis. Next slide, please. Two minutes, Noel. So in-season plant analysis, this is a schedule I generally recommend. Uh, early vegetable, take the whole plant when about three weeks or so, the plant's less than 10 inches, take the whole plant. Then after that, about bi-weekly uh, testing of the sap analysis, and that way you can customize and tailor your nutrient uptake for that plant to help mitigate as much stress as possible. Next slide, please. That is an example of the analysis. Next slide, please. And that is a uh, hemp crop. We came across this last year in Utah, having some nutritional uh, deficiencies. You can see some chlorosis. Next slide, please. A uh, farmer uh, had applied everything he could. Uh, the consultant working with him had done everything possible, but uh, we're still giving these uh, deficiencies. You can see the margin leaf fern. That is typical potassium deficiency. Uh, potassium is essential for oil uh, quality. In fact, he was applying potassium, but after we did a sap test, it was deficient potassium. What we did is come back and increase the rate and frequency. Next slide, please. Which fixed the problem. So that's the issue that I have with these cookie cutter programs that tell you when to apply this and that uh, throughout the growing season. You really can't uh, mitigate stress and optimize nutrition by doing that unless you do a sap analysis. Next slide, please. So three-step success, again, data collection, pre-plant water analysis, very important, heavy metal analysis. Uh, Again, personalized guidance by using SAP analysis. We also monitor CBD profiles, THC, start and bloom, make sure uh, we're monitoring that to avoid any pitfalls. Of course, we can give all the advice we can, but if, you, if the farmer does not follow that advice in a timely manner, uh, it can cost you uh, production. Next slide, please. So that's my contact information. Again, uh, one last thought uh, is where I tell people is I highly recommend doing soil testing. You'd be surprised how many people approach us and uh, said, uh, we just got this land, we planted already and uh, we're having issues. Well, you could avoid a lot of pitfalls, a lot of issues. We do some pre-plant soil tests, water analysis and, and sap analysis. And uh, you can have a, a, a good quality uh, crop that can be marketed very well and get uh, high returns on investment. Thank you. Thank you so much, Noel. That's awesome. And um, lots of awesome questions coming in. So we are gonna get to a few of those as fast as we can, and then we will try our hardest to get answers for you all even afterwards. But thank you to our audience for being so engaged. We love it. Uh, okay, so first question, Noel. Uh, we have two similar, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna give them both to you here. Uh, have you looked at the effects of nutrient ratios on cannabinoid profiles. Related question, um, is it a myth that cannabinoid and flavonoid uh, profiles can be impacted in positive ways through specific types of stress to the plants? Yes, in fact, that's what we're monitoring. Uh, unfortunately, up to, since uh, before last year, we were unable to uh, process any SAP analysis uh, legally in the state. So we're just looking at that now, this last year and this year, but we are seeing some trends where different nutrients can increase or, or, or affect the ratios of some of these cabotenoids. Uh, uh, we're looking at potassium very closely. We're looking at silicon, uh, another nutrient that can help sort of distress the plant and look at some of these hormones that the plants can generate themselves, uh, sort of protect themselves, but those are also affected by the nutrient content of the plant. I think that is absolutely fascinating. 
Uh, okay, last question here. I know there's many more, we'll get to them as we can, but uh, are there companion plants that work well intercropped with hemp or CBD oil? Oh, that's a good question. I think maybe Edgar or Doug can uh, have more experience on that. But uh, I think, yeah, there, there could be some relationships there. Uh, but uh, again, nutrition plays a vital role. Uh, highly recommend use the cover crops and so forth, legumes and uh, big biomass crops. And overall, just a better soil health. Okay, and we can come back to that with Edgar, but I'll throw one more in there because of that. What types of fertigation teas or brews have you found beneficial? Uh, compost teas are great. I uh, highly recommend those, but they're only good as your compost. So make sure to get a good compost test. Uh, highly beneficial. Uh, there's a lot of biological products we would call beneficial soil, bacteria, soil, inoculants. Highly beneficial. Uh, I would tell people, look at the labels, be looking for diversity. Uh, uh, there's a lot of bacillus products out there. They're good, uh, but bacillus only can be, uh, cannot take you to the next level. Rotate products, uh, be looking at um, mycorrhizae, uh, could be highly beneficial as well. Okay, and another one I'm gonna squeeze in here. How, it's a very specific question, but how, um, any advice on how to eliminate hemp rust mites? Ah, oh, rust mites are tough. Again, uh, plants are very susceptible to, in to insect pressure when they are nutritionally imbalanced. Potassium plays a vital role for, for overall health. Uh, we're looking at silicon too. Uh, I think that we can get enough silicon into the plant early on. It could help fight against a lot of these insect pressures that we're seeing. Great, thank you. We, we squeezed a lot into that Q&A session. Okay, so right now we are going to take a quick break, a five minute break. Um, please feel free, warm up that coffee that's probably gotten pretty cool. Uh, we will be back here in five minutes from now. So let's say 12, 19 mountain time. And um, yeah, we'll see you soon. <laughs>
we are just about to get started again. Hopefully you will all make it back to your computers here shortly. Uh, we will have Sarah Delevec introduce our next presenter, which is going to be Linnea Chimp. Once she's back. <laughs> I'm back, I promise. There you are. All right, and welcome back to everybody out there. We are on the home stretch now, and our next session is a real treat. Uh, I first met Sarah Cotterell and Jamie Perkins last year at another event, and I remember being really struck immediately by their enthusiasm for the work they're doing in the hemp space. But the more I learned, the more impressed I was by the level of sophistication and the holistic nature of their young regenerative hemp operation. They are able to speak to many different aspects of the expanding industrial hemp sector. And today they will share a little about their vertically integrated approach and their operation, Lineage Hemp, as well as offer key nuggets on finding or creating markets for your hemp. Please welcome Sarah and Jamie. Hi guys. Thanks for coming back after the break. Thanks for being here today. Um, we are thrilled to be part of this and love Sarah, Rachel, and the team. And, you know, you guys asked us to um, talk a little bit about marketing and our operation. I think Jamie and I could go on for days, if not weeks, about how much we love this plant in this space, and it gets us excited every time. But what we thought we would do today is just go through a little bit of our story, our experience, our approach, and hope that that gives you some insight. And you know, we're happy to answer any questions at the end of this or offline, but all the pictures you'll see in, in this little slideshow are our own pictures from what happened. Um, and we've got plenty of more that are not on the highlight reel. So you can go to the next slide, Rachel. So Lineage Hemp Group, is part of our larger regenerative ag company. And it started at the end of 2018 and grew out of our experience with and a passion for farming and the love of food and health all the way down to the soil level. And so Lineage Hemp Group itself is vertically in integrated from seed to sale. And so that means we grow everything from the seed to selling the product at the end. Um, whether that be oil or biomass or, you know, whatever else may arise at the moment. But we do it all with a, what we call a farmer first place-based approach. So we really feel like every farmer has a unique set of opportunities and challenges. Um, some farmers need a community to go with them to make them thrive. Others are motivated by you know, markets and, and crops that reward stewardship of the land. And then some people just need help kind of crystallizing that plan and the techniques to their vision. And so we try to come alongside and, and help in that space. Um, and we really do our best to meet farmers on the journey to help them thrive in what they're growing, whether it be the hemp plant, whether it be, um, other specialty crops, or we, we're even getting into the animal space at this point in, in Regen Ag. So we really, we really get excited and kind of dream big about what the land wants to be and how to implement this regenerative ag model on a larger scale. Um, and then we try to put these plans and ideals into action with our past business and farming experience, with the innovation, with the community, and then plug it into this new emerging market. Next slide. So when we think about hemp, we think about it in both the, the micro and macro views. So like I talked about, we use hemp as a tool in our regenerative agriculture. And we grew a bunch of hemp ourselves and then we partnered with farmers that grew a lot of hemp. And this has been an awesome um, webinar, I think, because what you've started to hear about is the hemp policy side, the seed choice side, the lab, the amendments, how to grow healthy plants. And I think it really points out or puts an exclamation point on the fact that um, this is all part of a system. And we feel like it's imperative that you look at the whole system um, and its functionality. And that's where you're really gonna get healthy. That's what happens on the like micro level, nitty gritty of the soil, you get into the farming of the plant, it goes into the organic building of a company and it kind of ripples out from there. Um, and so it's what we've tried to do at Lineage 
And it's part of the reason that we're vertically integrated in what we do. And so last year we grew everything from small acre CBD to large acre CBD. We grew CBD for seed, we grew fiber for seed, we grew fiber. We tried to grow some grain, but mother nature had other plans and washed that out um, for us. And we said, yes, thank you. Um, you know, we got into the drying, the processing, the selling of the, the oil and the seed and the biomass. And we have done a lot of research. We have tried things in every which way, putting things er in early, putting them in late, fertilizing, not fertilizing, composting, not composting, you know, planting things with it, not how do you run your rows. So we just, we keep trying to do all these different trial and error methods at the same time, you know, relying on the veterans out there that have been using this a plant a long time. So we, we try to have our best research possible, um, but we keep, we keep moving and evolving um, and trying to share that innovation then out to a wider group. Next slide. All right. It may be an ancient plant, but the market is still in its infancy. Um, I think some of the things that you need, need to realize if you're, especially if you're new, is that um, this, this is all new to really everyone. Um, we're all kind of like blazing our own path. So some of the questions that you need to ask yourself before you ever get started would be, what am I set to do without spending a ton of money on equipment? Um, I've seen farmers go out there and spend millions of dollars tooling themselves up for this. And it, I mean, that's just crazy. Like you, you need to get a good season on what equipment you currently have now. And then you can tool up after that if you feel like you, you've got a place in the market. Um, another thing that we're seeing, the sad thing that we're seeing these days is these farmers are risking their farms because they think that hemp's going to be the savior. And the minute that you think that, just pack it up. So make sure that you can spend a little money on hemp and you're not going to risk the rest of your operation or your farm or any of your family savings or any of that stuff. Um, the other thing that I I saw a lot last year was people didn't have access to labor and they it's this is kind of if you're doing a CBD especially and you're doing a smokable product or anything like that you need access to labor. You're not going to go out there and and use a bunch of equipment to knock down smokable hemp and think that you're going to actually sell it. So access to labor is super important. So those are kind of my top three to get through. Most of you guys aren't fully integrated. So you will be working with another company to purchase your product or you, know, you have to have an outlet. And um, I, I'd say the first thing that, that everyone should get is a contract from that company and make sure that company last year paid their farmers. Number one thing, double check that they paid their farmers. You don't need to see how much money they have or anything like that. Make sure that they came through on their end and get a contract from them, a specific contract on what specs are gonna be looked for from like from us. When we're, when we're talking to a farmer or a company that they're gonna grow for us, we have some pretty specific specs and I can run through a couple of them and I get too detailed. This would take a lot of time if I did, but um, you know, we, we prefer, prefer organic. Um, it, on the fiber side, it's depending on what we're dealing with it, it's not as important, but we pretty much try to be organic on everything that we do. Um, if it's our CBD side, we have a 10% minimum. So if you grow, if you think you're going to take a bunch of seed and grow for us and you end up with 6% because you didn't check the genetics and you think we're going to buy it, then you're wrong. Um, we'd usually pretty much tell you what genetics we're, we want you to use, but um, if, if someone brings us something that's under 10%, we're not going to process that. For our fiber side, we, we look at stalk heights and the harvest, the way that you harvest and how you're going to harvest because we have specific equipment we're putting that into. So we want it a specific way. Um, on our grain side, uh, we, we pretty much look for overhead pivots on, on stuff. And that's, you know, a little bit bigger acreage things. And then, you know, we have a kind of an expectation we're going to pay a certain amount per pound per acre. So those are some important things to look for, whether you're dealing with us or someone else, they're, they're going to want spe specs of their stuff. And you're, you're going to have to meet those things to make any money in this. All right, next slide. Yeah. And you just, you know, to kind of carry on what Jamie said, you, you have to define in the beginning what you're doing. Are you wanting to sell business to business? Are you wanting to sell business to 
a consumer, you know, who's your market? And we kind of joke right now that the hemp world is a little bit like a middle school dance, right? We're all out there and we're trying to feel each other out and we, you know, you do you get too close or how's that look? And it's, it's this awkward dance that's happening right now. But I think, you know, some of our lessons learned is really define your why, find your lane and then stay true to our mission. And we founded our whole company on healing and the creation of health, starting with the soil, the family farmer, the individual, and it ripples out from there. And this really for us is a family thing. There's my um, 11 year old son in the picture learning about the, the hemp plant. And the challenge in any kind of startup company or new plant or anything you do is this, how do you stay firmly anchored to your mission and yet you're still able to, um, you know, have the strategy and the work and the people and the ideas and the action be ever actively evolving. And we continue to discover new things. And we do that both on the sales side and the product side. Um, you know, we've talked about there being competition for good product. And so it goes again to like, who do you want to sell to? What do you want to do? What are you good at? What's your gift? And then really pursue that. Um, because I will tell you that I did not appreciate it probably until the last year that building a brand takes a lot of work. It is a lot of work. There's a lot of research, innovation, creativity. There's a ton of fun that goes into it, but there's a ton of time and more time and there's capital. I mean, this can be a capital intensive thing that you need. It doesn't mean you shouldn't do it, but it comes back to if you can stay firmly anchored in what you believe in, it's easier to kind of keep getting up each day. And for us, what we decided was important was more than just, um, you know, putting a CBD oil out on the market. And I think you heard the same thing from Doug. It's really about building a lifestyle more than that product. Um, and we're dealing in emerging, we're dealing in new markets, and we're attempting to build resilience and adaptability into everything we do. And so as you set up your company or your brand, think about those things. Think about, okay, as the, the market crashes, what do I do? Or how am I going to be able to shift and change and still stay true to things? Um, so on the CBD side of marketing, for example, we, we sell our oil different ways. We sell it through word of mouth. We sell it in stores. We sell it online and we sell it through ambassadors and in, in part because we feel like people want, have, want to be part of a mission. And for us, allowing people to be part of this regenerative agriculture mission is a really awesome thing. Not only do you get good plant medicine in the hands of somebody, but you also continue to educate people on hemp on a whole and why we're growing this way. And so that's part of why we approach things the way that we do. Um, but I think there's this gap between, I call it kind of the, the whiteboard dreams, and then the reality of getting it into practice. And it's, it's hard. Right, it requires a whole lot of perseverance, and you know we kind of have this whole spaghetti soup, and some days it's two steps forward and five steps back, um, and there's the 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 toll and the grind and all the things you don't see on the highlight reel, like this um, new field we were prepping yesterday that we'd done some irrigation work on, and you know we had big rain Sunday night, and you know one of our farm hands ended up, I kid you not, almost waist deep in that field. He stepped um, right where we dug the irrigation. <laughs> right into the irrigation, right? And, you know, and last year we had a bunch of rains too. Jamie and I thought we might just open like a water amusement park with a bunch of inflatables on one of our new fields. So you, you have that stuff. You got to laugh. You got to have fun with it all day long. But I think part of it for us is we love farming. We love getting our hands dirt, but we have been so inspired by the stories of the farmers. And we really want to be a part of telling those stories, talking about the, the journey and the, you know, the faith in the metal, the getting back up again, and the regeneration that happens with the land, but also happens with families. We've seen families, you know, come back together and farming is like an awesome thing for these multi-generations. You've got the, you know, 80 year old dad who all of a sudden goes, oh, I have something to do now. You know, I can check on these plants and you've got the 50 year old farmer that's out there. And then you've got their kids who maybe weren't gonna come home but are coming home. And especially now with, you know, the, the coronavirus sequestration that we're in, it gives everybody something to do. And it's been really fun to be a part of 
that coming together. Um, and so that's an important part of us for our brand is telling that story, both of regeneration and the farmer and all the good that the plant can do. And I think in our day-to-day -day life, what we really try to do is to celebrate the epic greatness of these small moments. And I would encourage you guys to do that throughout the whole farming process and your experience with the hemp plant in general. Next slide. Two minutes. Oh, talk fast. Oh, whoops. <laughs> Oh, I lost my notes. So <laughs> Jamie and I think that this might be us one day, if you want to laugh at this. Um, but hemp is, you know, it really is an emerging market. And I don't think we can we can say enough about that. That that comes into everything we do, that it is unstable, that it's unpredictable. Um, that you know, you get into these compliance issues, right? Not only like what seed can I buy and how do I get it into my state? And then what are the THC levels? And um, you get into FDA and USDA. I can just rattle it off since I lost my notes. <laughs> but I did find my, my notes from last year from a Doug Fine uh, talk that I listened to. So that was great. <laughs> Um, yeah, so uh, with compliance, one of the things I want to say is last year, we kind of ran into where our state changed some compliance stuff on us in the middle of the growth season. So make sure you're up to date with your local and state compliance. USDA and FDA right now are not uh, really set on their rules yet. And I think a lot of states will adapt to those rules. Um, so just, you know, be, be on board with that. Your local, if you have an ag extension office or um, your Department of Ag for your state online will have whatever hemp guidelines they have most likely. You can also go to the USDA and FDA websites and and see kind of where they're at. Um, social media kind of plays a role in there. Sometimes social media is good and bad on some of that um, with, you know, especially with social media on any type of marketing. That's really tough for us. Um, you know, you've got, it's coming around and, um, you know, Facebook, Instagram, they, they kind of almost block you out. We've had to change some stuff, um, right? You know, mid marketing campaign because they, they kind of push us down to the bottom or they just take us out completely. Um, so you, you've got to be very um, um, quick, I guess, with with your marketing and stuff. So social media, I, I always tell people to use that with a grain of salt and don't believe everything you read on there. Also make sure you're checking, uh, especially compliance stuff, make sure you're checking on that kind of stuff. Um, uh, what else did you cover? Sorry, I was in my notes. Okay. There's, there's uh, the biggest learn. thing, lots to learn. So <laughs> the thing I saw last year was, um, you know, and we're still learning ourselves. She talk, talked about all the testing that we did last year and we're still doing this year. She's holding a plant right now that actually is in, in test mode. Um, to, we're testing a bunch of nutrients on it. Um, is, is get as educated as you can. I mean, you guys are in the right place right now with, with the acres side of things. Um, you know, you guys you know, find a company to work with that, that offers some education and stuff or, or just find people that, that you know has grown the plant and does understand the challenges that come in with this specific plant. Because from the farming standpoint, it's a lot different than anything else that you've grown. And if you're growing corn, this is not corn. Um, it, it's a whole different market. So really have some education under your belt a little bit before you plant a seed and kind of know, get, get educated on what you're going to run into. All right, next All right. slide. Next slide. Abundance. This is my favorite word because I think it just sums up this whole plant. So, you know, we are seed to sale and we work with our, our people kind of every step of the way. You need to build your team. You need those people that are there with you that you can call and say, oh my gosh, I need help. Or what do you think about that it is so important. And there's this tremendous opportunity to partner and create and create these relationships and, and innovate. And on top of that, we've got health impact. We've got you know building back farms. We've got the climate and the water cycle. And so um, just have fun, work hard, have fun. Let us know if we can answer questions. I think our our contact is on the next slide, Rachel. And then, yeah, we're open to questions. Thanks guys, that was great. Um, a little bit different um, take on stuff and we will move into a few questions. I think we have about almost four minutes for questions. Um, so here's a big one. You guys work with a lot of different farmers from what I understand. Um, what, <laughs> 
you're, you need to look in your crystal ball for everybody. Best markets for farmers to grow and sell into for 2020. <laughs> Again, it goes back to there's like there's no one size that fits all, and so we always say like, what do you have? What are you equipped to do? Do you have an acre, or do you have 200 acres? And that'll make yeah. a difference. Yeah, and I I think some of this pro there's not as many processors as people think in fiber. There's hardly any. I mean, we're we're putting our equipment in. There's a company in Texas putting theirs in, I, and there's some maybe some decorticators, but actually to process fiber out. There's not many. Um, on the CBD side, I would just say grow really good stuff and you'll you'll not have a problem. I mean, if you, if you can really dial it in, start small. Um, yeah, some people, I, if your state will allow you to do a quarter acre, I think our minimum is an acre in it. Um, a quarter acre, do one year of a quarter acre. I don't think the CBD market's crashed and gone. It's, it's crashed, it moved some people out of the way that probably had no business being in the market, which is a good, good thing. Um, it'll start to climb back up a little bit. So I, I would say the if you grow really good stuff, it's the same with all farming. If you grow really great stuff, you'll be able to move it. Um, but be educated and, and know how to do it. Um, so I, I wouldn't say that there's a specific market. It's more what you're tooled to do, mm -hmm. what acreage you have, and and really put the time into it. Because if you with him, man, if you don't if you don't give it the right love, it it will not produce for you. And we can, like, if people want to reach out to us offline and we can see if, you know, we may be the right market for that. I don't promise that we are, but, you know, we can certainly help connect people up with our network to see if there are places that make sense for you. That's great. And that's an awesome offer. Um, we'll make sure everybody has your contact information after this as well. Uh, one, going back to that fiber conversation, and I don't know how hard this will be to answer, but you guys can let me know. Um, one of the questions we had leading up to the event was what, um, what type of processing facility is needed to process the plants into fiber? A big one. Well, so, <laughs> so you're, we're in our warehouse right now. And I mean, we're 500,000 square foot and we'll use probably half of it for fiber. Mm -hmm. And the fiber equipment isn't always, I want to like super technical. It takes up a whole lot of space. And then where you get into the technicalities is there's a lot of decortication or not a lot, but there are some of those. But if you're using it for insulated car panels, it may require different specs than if you're using it for a bioplastic. And one of the challenges is storage. Mm -hmm. Like when all that stuff comes off the field, you have to have a place to keep that. Uh, most farmers don't like to store it usually. Um, from what we found, unless you're going to pay them to store it. Uh, so you've got to have a spot to take in. I mean, you know, I guess on our scale, you've got to have a whole nother set of acres to hold the bales that come in to get ready to process. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, I'm going to squeeze one, one. We got a question in asking where you guys are. You're in Indiana. Is that correct? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, just want to get that one out of the way. And then quick one, we'll see if we can answer this one quickly. How would an NPK fertilizer program fit into a hemp field? Do you, do you guys- Like a traditional NPK? Mm -hmm. Depends on the soil test. Yeah. Right, Noel? <laughs> it does depend on the soil test. There we go. Yeah, I mean, they're, they're good pieces to NPK, but it really depends on what you're starting from. And I think that's the message with anything you grow is getting that nutrient dense soil, figuring out what you have to start with so you know what you need to add um, to, to have healthy plants makes all the difference. Awesome. And maybe we can, maybe we'll get to that one in our panel discussion, which is coming right up. So thank you both for sharing your unique perspective on um, the hemp production that you guys are doing and the work you're doing. Um, before we move on to our panel discussion and invite our other uh, speakers back into the conversation, I would again like to thank Linda Chemp, um, not only for the great content that you just shared with us, but for uh, your support of this event. And here's a quick message from them. Why hemp? <laughs> Hemp is a great tool because what it does is it provides a market where farmers can actually make some money. And one of the biggest challenges with hemp right now, especially since it's an emergent market, is finding what you do with it. So we provide that outlet. Basically, we let the farmers do what they're really good at, and we take a lot of the other business stuff off of their plate. 
We founded the whole company based on healing and the creation of health, starting with the soil to help the family farmer, help the individual, and then to ripple out from there. And so everything we do is grounded in that mission. Thank you again to Linda Champ and to all of our sponsors. We really appreciate that. I'm going to invite all of our speakers back in now. I might even show my face for a little while. Um, OK, so we would like to have a quick panel discussion. We have about 16 minutes scheduled for conversation at this point. Uh, but what we'd like to do is uh, I have about five key questions I'd like to get in. So we'll try to answer them promptly, but also make sure you all get the information that you need. And then uh, we will also make sure afterwards that you have contact information and we'll work on getting other answers for other questions that we don't get to. So uh, I'd like to start off today with what will seem like a big question for each of our panelists, but let's, uh, let's see how concise we can be. Uh, what are, the question was, what are some of the concerning forces that come along with hemp farming? I would like each of you to take one maybe of the biggest concern that comes along with hemp farming for you and your experience. And we will start from the top. So, and we haven't heard from you in a while, Edgar, um, we'll start with you and then we'll work our way back, I think. And we, you are muted, Edgar, there we go. Okay, can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. Can you hear me now? I'm having a reset up here. Well, we can hear you, Edgar. Okay, good. Uh, okay, there's. Uh, you said uh, what kind of problems might exist when you're trying to do some farming of hemp? What's oh, your God, yeah? I, what's your biggest concern when you enter hemp farming? Uh, the end product and what it's going to look like and where is it going to go? Doug. I hope this is going away. The number one issue in hemp right now, as we discussed earlier, is raising the THC definition, which involves changing federal law. Um, all this talk about trying to unify genetics and all that, to me, is let's go completely the opposite direction. This is how has monoculture worked out for farmers on the planet? This is a time to diversify genetics. The more genetic variety, the better. And a great way to do it and put it in the hands of farmers is let farmers develop their genetics and let them own their genetics and let them be on farmer entrepreneurs and start that immediately. Call your congressman and senator. Most are on board. Almost everyone's on board. Raise the federal THC level to 1%. That is vital. Thank you, Doug. Noel. I, along those lines, I believe the same thing. I think people need to uh, concentrate on nutrition and grow oil, not the THC. And uh, you heard Jamie talk about it. I've been approached at many of these conferences where I speak about these issues that they can't get rid of their hemp, they grow it and so forth. Then come around and ask them, well, what's the potency? Well, six, 8%. So you got to go and grow quality and that uh, you grow quality nutritionally, uh, you will have low THC most likely. Thanks, Noel. And Sarah and Jamie, you can have one together or you can each have your own. It's up to you. Okay. I'll, uh, I was going to go on genetics also, that uh, know where your seed's coming from. There's a lot of, uh, of people out there that were promoting some rough stuff. I mean, to the point where I had seen people were selling fiber seed as CBD seed. So really know where your stuff's coming from. Uh, I think it's super important. And I'm going to keep hitting on the soil side of things. If you get healthy soil, you get healthy plants. They're basically, you know, they become much more immune to insects and disease. You then get healthy nutrient dense plants on the end that are much better to sell and consume. That's great. So we had, we hit on the marketing aspect, getting it to market. We hit on the THC and we hit on the soil. I, I'm loving it. Thank you. Okay, let's move to our next question. Uh, where in the hemp industry would a small scale grower succeed best? And what advice would you have for starting and protecting a local hemp market? Uh, anybody in particular want to jump at this one? Sorry, I was half paying attention to that question. Um, you're, where should a small CBD grower start? Sarah, is that what you're asking? I, I mean, I think some of the- again, goes back to like, do you want to sell your own product or not? 
Um, if you want to sell your own product, there, there are markets to do that. It's, it's having something that makes a unique product. It's selling it locally. It's using your community and your, your skills. Um, what do you have to add to that? Yeah, I'm, I, I think, I actually think anyone, no one should jump in and do a hundred acres. I mean, really, I think um, people should start as small as they can get one season on their belt, learn how complicated the plant can be. Um, I, I do think I do. You'll hear me preach all the time that people overcomplicate it, but I think if someone's brand new to it, um, that they're, they're usually not prepared for that, um, what it takes. So start small and then you can take those same numbers and scale them up to an acre to two acres to five acres. Great. Anybody else have um, advice on uh, where a small scale grower can succeed best? Doug? I would say think about value added um, and top shelf craft quality. You're not going to be the one that's getting in the chain drugstore with CBD isolate. That's, and that's not uh, what you want to be doing. And that's not how we save humanity through climate change mitigation. Uh, cultivate top shelf outdoor organic product. And as far as which side of the plant to grow for, whatever your favorite hemp product is, grow, grow for that. Whatever you want to do the best and that you like the best, start with that. I personally like to nudge people towards the seed side because it's a superfood and we, we, we need that. We've got a dietary crisis worldwide. And if you're growing outside, you're building soil, but you can do, I, I do a, a flower, as I mentioned earlier, flower and a seed product. I mean, the same product flower in the seed oil. So you can do more than one uh, with with one crop and don't follow the herd be a leader and market it you have to get out there and find the people that are going to enjoy your product afterwards it's not going to happen by magic thank you all right uh i want to take a, a step back just so all of our listeners out there which we do have a great group of right now an engaged group uh can each of you go through and let us know how many acres or what, what scale you're growing hemp at at this point. For those of you, Edgar, you all yeah, you I'll, yeah, I'll start off on that. Uh, I actually am growing 22 acres here in Southern Oregon. I actually have employed uh, 22 other states that I help grow uh, hemp on. I'm a seed provider. And so I, I'm involved with 22 different states right now in growing hemp. But uh, I, I personally only grow 22 acres and I grow, uh, for research and development. I'm Perfect. working with yeah. several universities here in America and we do a lot of research and development. Great, thank you. Doug, how many acres do you have? 187 million, that's how many we need to uh, make hemp, match corn, combined corn, soy, cotton and wheat. Okay, so that's just a dream. Um, this year, uh, only in three uh, states, and each of them is different. And the third uh, is a uh, uh, consulting. It's genetics Edgar and I are working on uh, with consulting clients. Um, but the two states where I'm active is uh, the commercial organic product I talked about cultivated in Vermont. And then here in New Mexico, it's seed development, taking this tri-crop cultivar um, and been doing some fun Gregor Mendel style crossbreeding um, to, uh, so to uh, 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 try to create a cultivar that, that, uh, that works uh, well, and so grand total this year, I forgot how many they're growing there in Arkansas, uh, Edgar, but overall, I, th I think they're doing something like 10. So I'll call it 14 acres total this year. Great. Thank you, Sarah. Uh, we're growing over 1200 acres this year. and We grew about that last year. Awesome. Okay. So I wanted to make sure our audience had that person. And Noel, forgive me, but you're not growing. No, That's right, right. Okay, just want to make sure. Didn't want to feel left out because this next question you'll have a lot to contribute to. But I wanted to make sure our audience had those things in mind as we asked the next next question, which is um, we we've gotten a lot of questions uh, both before the webinar and during the webinar about fertilizers and fertility. Um, could the panel quickly talk about what they use and when they time their applications in the grow cycle? Um, and so I guess we could go with each of our growers to tell us a little bit about that. And then Noel, I'd love to hear your thoughts on that as well. we'll okay, I'll, I'll, I'll start on that. Uh, I, I'm fortunate enough to, to grow on acreage that has not been tilled in over a hundred years. I own a, a century farm here in Oregon. 
And uh, be honest with you, I like uh, I like fertile grounds that hasn't been tilled uh, in several years because uh, then the nutrients are, are uh, more attainable what I need to put into that soil and what I don't need to put into that soil. So I, uh, I usually start with, uh, uh, I feed the medium first, not the plant. Uh, I'm also a medical marijuana uh, a grower here in Oregon for the last 22 years. So I try to uh, do the medium first and, and then the plant will strive on what the medium that you give it. And I'm strictly organic, by the way. Should yeah, I jump but... in? Go for it. Go Love for your background. It. Love your background, Sarah. I don't know if the audience can see, but uh, but uh, it's a beautiful um, field. Uh, so, um, like Edgar, um, I and it, first of all, the answer is it completely varies on your crop. You should be there's that shit again. I recommend soil testing uh, early in uh, before the before the season. It's an easy thing to do. It's not that expensive. You can do even more than NPK. You can do organic content. And um, but um, so more what you would call traditional scientific when I have consulting clients, especially if they've been on stressed soil that's grown non organically. Um, you need to heal that soil before you're growing for any kind of product, especially a food product. Um, but I've been lucky in that Vermont, it was just a healthy, awesome pasture that hadn't been cultivated in decades. And let, in those kind of cases, often less is more. For my home field, which I've been growing vegetables on for a decade plus, um, and now hemp second year of hemp alongside the vegetables. Um, it's a polyculture kite th thing and it's, and it's uh, I go with what works, which is I put my, uh, as I mentioned earlier, just shovel out, my kids and I shovel out the alfalfa and go poop mixture in the barn that's been seasoned for a year or more and spread that on the field. And it, it's, an, an, we just shot a really fun uh, time-lapse where it's unbelievable the sort of insect like micro, and in life, the one, uh, the one, uh, there's a few other things I will add to the soil. One is I go up into the hills and gather mycelium and brew it into a com uh, compost fungus tea, and I apply that that to the soil because it's important to build fungus life, fungal life. And I've learned that fungal life is often the most lacking in soil, and I prefer to gather it rather than buy it. What they call bugs in a jug, prefer to develop. I think it's more regenerative and sustainable. The one thing I do bring in is when I'm near an ocean, I'll gather ocean water and dilute it. Um, a lot, forget if it's 30 to one or 300 to one, but I do do this anytime I, I can be at the ocean and that's got every trace mineral on it. And if I haven't been to the ocean for a while, there's a couple of good kelp companies that I'll uh, do highly diluted kelp for trace um, mineral supplements. But for the most part, I'm supplementing with local uh, nutrients. Thank you, Dan. Sarah and Jamie. I think we would echo basically what Edgar and Doug have said. We have a lot of our own you know, slurries and compost teas that, that we put on. We have um, found some really good luck with Monty's Hemp Pro, that Hemp Pro line as a very kind of simple, easy, you're beginning to get into this organic way of fertilizing your plants. Yeah. Cool. Missed the question, sorry. But... Oh, what we put on it. <laughs> Okay, uh, Noel, uh, what do you have to add on that? And, and particularly with application timing? Uh, application timing, like I said, uh, keep it to a minimum early on uh, during early vegetative growth. Once you to go into the reproductive stage, that's when you want to increase the, your, uh, your nutrient. Uh, as far as product wise, there's a lot of organic products out there. Uh, even conventional products that are good. Uh, I tend to stick with uh, food sources that are, are better for oversoil health. Uh, amino acid-based products, fulvic humic acid products, uh, kelp, uh, seaweed, uh, all these different uh, uh, soil adjuvants and amendments can be highly beneficial just for an overall healthier soil. Okay, Nolan, I want to follow up with another, um, a different question, but uh, on your, in your area of expertise here, where do contaminants live in the plants and are these parts of the plants as usable as others? Uh, it varies on the plant. Uh, again, uh, if you're going more for CBD and quality and so forth, uh, it can get into the buds. But again, there are some useful adjuvants out there, for example, uh, zeolites, uh, silicons that can help sort of 
prevent the uptake of some of these nutrients. We're still doing some research on it, but I have a feeling that uh, a lot of these issues that we're having is because of lack of neglect. Uh, we're not approaching the plant in, in a way to where it's balanced nutritionally across the board, and that's where we get into pitfalls. Great, thank you. Okay, we're we're almost there, folks. I we have received a lot of questions about um, crop rotations with hemp, so I'm curious who all has practiced that and what insight or, or again nuggets uh, you can provide to our audience about that practice today. And I'm here for whoever raises their hand first. Have at it. Okay, I'll answer that. Uh, my production end of it, I I, I wanted to, to stay that away from the beginning. You know, uh, I've changed so many different ways of growing. As a retired master gardener out of Oregon State University, I've, I've grown and, and sowed so many different seeds and so many different elements of, of, of productions. So, you know, I, I have mixed emotions about it. And I, I, I know that hemp, as far as a rotation of a crop, uh, I've been growing hemp on the same piece of property for the last six years. Uh, I don't rotate it uh, because hemp is is there to uh, bring the soil back to its uh, get all the impurities out. It actually enhances the soil. If you wanted to uh, uh, use a, a rotation crop, I would say hemp. Uh, I'm, I'm a firm believer in hemp, and uh, I don't ro rotate it. I grow it year after year. Thank you. Andrew. If you look at um, some uh, like medieval sketches uh, from French hemp fields, Chinese hemp fields, there are fields that have been in operation for, for a millennium, but that doesn't mean that it's monoculture. Um, it really depends on your definition of, of rotation. So for me, um, that overwintering, that building up of the soil through an overwintering uh, soil building crop and adding that nitrogen that's in the alfalfa and goat poop, your, your return and the fungus, the, the mycelium, you're returning to the soil and you're allowing the soil to naturally build up its microbiome. So it's that's not the same thing as monoculture that's just chopping it down, plowing it up, applying, poison and then throwing in chemical nutrients. So um, you can continue on the same crop. That said, we're all such a new industry just in their surrounding fields from one that we're now on our third season on that after eight, nine, we'll, we'll continue, we'll be looking at it. And if we're doing everything we need to do and rebuilding the nutrients, we'll keep doing it, but I don't have any problem moving to another pasture and just spending a year or two fallow on one pasture. I mean, that's, that's how farmers have, have always done things until pretty darn recently. So I think it's a good idea, one possible, even um, with hemp. And quickly, um, uh, I saw a question on how do we press hemp? And this is a, uh, you, for, the, for the seed oil part of, of our product. And this is a good question because it's about how you have to think on your feet as, as a small farmer entrepreneur. My very first year cultivating hemp in Vermont, um, the farmer that I worked with that year had a seed oil press on site. And that's why we chose for this hemp and hemp product to infuse the flour and hemp seed oil. It was so fortuitous that we had zero expenses and tons of seed from growing dioecious, something that would have been very expensive for most people to do. Most people would be using coconut oil or something along those lines. And it turned out to be the best thing and we've never looked back. And then since then, all the every subsequent year, my partner, cultivation partners in Vermont are a different group. And we um, have to think on our feet in terms of finding where we're gonna press until we have enough revenue as a company to purchase the hemp seed oil press. So it's really about thinking on your feet. Thank you. We got a twofer on that one, didn't we? Two answers for the for one shot. Yeah, Sarah, can I just add on that? Because we've seen it in large acre grows and we've seen it go in after corn and we've seen it go in after beans in the rotation. Um, and it goes back to, again, what's that soil starting out as, but we didn't have any problems with it. I will tell you one of our very best fiber fields went in after winter wheat that was you know chopped and dropped and then we put the fiber in and it was amazing. Thank you. We actually did have a question about that, about specific to corn and soy, rotating it with that, if there'd been any experience with that. So that's interesting. Thank you. Noel, anything to add to that? Or Jamie? I think rotation is vital. You really need to uh, break up the, uh, the monoculture that you have. And just the overall health, like I've been saying, talking about, uh, I think wheat, I think you had all that 
stubble there and all that return of the nutrients in there is probably why they got such a great response after the wheat. Oh, okay. Listen, we are about four minutes over, but you guys uh, offered so much great information. Um, I wanted to make sure we got to it. I have one final question for you all. Um, we, our audience has uh, taken in a lot of information from you all. Thank you for sharing it over this two hours. It's great. Um, but that was a lot of information. So I'd like each of you to share one lesson or one idea that, that you would like our audience to walk away with today. If they only had the brain capacity for one idea from each of you, what would that be? And Edgar, you've been great leading us. We'll start with you. Well, you know, you know, I think the very first thing is uh, have, an end, have an end result on what, what do you want? What do you want in the end if you're gonna be growing this industrial hemp? What, what is your end result there? If you don't know your end result, I think you're gonna have a problem in getting started. So uh, what we usually do, we work from back we work from the distributing end back to the growing end. So we, we, we work ourselves back and, and then we get to the point to where we realize that we have an end product, so let's begin. And that's what we, we try to do at Winter Fox Farms. We, we go on the end product and work from the beginning to make sure that it comes out on the end product the way we want it to by using good genetics. Wonderful, thank you. Doug. I'll keep it short and simple. We are all soil farmers now. What comes up over the ground, up from the ground is about months or longer preparation and love in the soil beforehand from a uh, um, collection of critters, many of whom we can't see at all. We can see the worms, but we can't see the, the beneficial bacteria and the fungus for the most part, and, unless they're in colonies. And so, um, yes, yeah, start, start with soil and a wonderful hemp crop will result. And this is, um, extends to your whole enterprise. It's the ninth inning with two outs for humanity. There's no time for, oh, we'll get regenerative next year, or we'll get rid of our plastic packaging next year, or we'll pay our farmers well next year. This is now, this is, this is it, ninth inning. Good luck, everybody. <laughs> You're here. Noel. I think you, you really have to start off with good genetics. Uh, keep it small. Do your homework. Uh, be surprised how many people uh, are all of a sudden experts uh, one day to the next. So do your homework. Uh, ask a lot of questions and uh, and uh, make sure and just uh, uh, follow nature and uh, listen to it and test, 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 test. Thank you. And and to echo what you all have said, we now all of you out there listening now have acres and you have all these panelists here as a resource um, for your homework that you're working on. So thank you, Noel, Sarah, and Jamie. Go, go ahead. Oh, mine's always going to be about your mission. Find your why, figure it out. It'll help you on the good days. It'll help you on the tough days. Um, kind of figure out that where do you want to be and then be adaptable and open to the ways that you get there. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stay with, stay with Noel there. Is, um, everyone seems to be an expert all of a sudden. They've never grown anything, but they've got a hemp consulting business. So um, just do your research on people, everybody here. I know who all these guys are, um, that they're good to reach out to and ask questions of. Uh, just, you know, kind of be careful. It's, it's sad to say, but you have to kind of watch your back in this industry. And that's a great balance of inspiration, motivation, and um, caution, right? We all need a little all of that. Uh, so I just want to offer a very heartfelt thank you to all of you incredible speakers out there. Thank you for participating today. I know our audience is muted right now, but I also know that they are giving you a, a big round of applause for everything you've given them today and the comments are pouring in. So thank you, you for that. Um, to our audience, uh, I know we've been messaging and chatting with you. Uh, we know we didn't get to all the questions and we know you may have further questions. Um, if you have further questions, please email gm at acresusa.com. We'll have someone put that in the chat right now. Um, and we are going to work hard to get answers to the questions we didn't answer uh, and make sure they're distributed via email. I am going to say thank you and pass this over to Rachel now for a final message. Thank you. Awesome. Yeah, thank you, everyone. This was an amazing presentation. I really hope our participants learned a lot from it and would invite you to look into our event in October. It's going to be October 5th and 6th here in Greeley, Colorado. A lot of the same folks you've heard today will be joining us for that full day of sessions with a uh, industrial um, hemp farm and industry tour uh, the following day. So please check our website for those details. Uh, as Sarah said, we are gonna be sending this webinar 
to all the registrants. So be looking for that in your email inbox. Um, and please take a moment to fill out that poll. Uh, it should still be sitting in your uh, mini bar. So thank you so much for joining us and we hope to see you again soon. Okay, so that was great dress rehearsal, everyone. When do we do the real event? <laughs> I've, I've, I've stopped recording just in time for Doug to speak up. That was perfect. <laughs> well, well done. Phew. Good job, everybody. Yeah, nice job. Nice, great. nice job. Thank Very you so well much. done. I can't, I can't tell you fun, how guys. awesome that was. That was a goal. Sorry, we had a seed shipment going out in the middle of this that we didn't expect. <laughs> it was perfect. It was, I, we couldn't have planned it better. Uh, that's I'm sure I was calling you Rachel because I saw her. Face that yeah. <laughs> so well, very well done we are very very grateful to you guys that was a the big kickoff to our uh, to our hemp content so really appreciate that well good i can't wait to you know celebrate in person yeah right <laughs>